Welcome to the Faith Lift Radio Podcast, where doubt is destroyed and your faith is lifted. Here's today's message from Dr. Glenn. Okie dokie. Let's bow our head. Let's have a word of prayer and then go straight into the word today. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the word. We thank you for these, your wonderful people. They've got ears to hear, mind to understand, and heart to receive the word of the living God in Jesus' mighty name. Everybody say amen. All right. Now, let's go to our foundational text, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. The great apostle Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, and he says, For the preaching of the cross, or the logos of the cross, is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who are saved, those who are perishing. Are you listening? Those who are saved, those who are unsaved. The Bible is very... Uh, <clears throat> clear about that. There are those who are saved and those who are unsaved. All right. So the preaching of the cross, the, 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 the word logos here, the word preaching is the logos of the cross means the message of the cross. Everybody say the message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness or moronic, but unto us, we which are saved. How many pe saved people do I have here today? If you're saved, say, I am saved. Come on now. Sir. If you're saved, say with me, I am saved. Amen. It is the power of God. Can you say amen? Now, I want you to write this down, please. The message of the cross is Christocentric. Now, what does that mean? That's a big, huge word, but what does that mean? Well, let's, let's, let's finish this sentence. The message of the cross is Christocentric and not self-centric. It is centered around Christ, not around you. Okay? What does that mean then, Christocentric? I want you to write this down in your own personal notes. Christocentric is a doctrinal term within Christianity <clears throat> describing theological positions that focus on Jesus Christ. Uh, let me say it again. Christocentric is a doctrinal term within Christianity describing theological positions that focus on Jesus Christ being the second person of the of, of the Trinity in relationship to in relation to the Godhead. All right, God, of course you know the Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Christocentric theologies, all right, or Christocentric theology makes Christ the central theme about which all other theological positions or doctrines are oriented. You hear now? All right. Was that a mouthful for you? All right. Did you did, did that kind of break your brain right now? Oh my God, my that's just oh, dude. No, it's very simple. Okay, you need to trust yourself. Okay, it's not that deep. It's it's uh, it's fundamental. It, this is fundamental Christianity. So, the message of the cross is Christocentric. What does Christocentric mean? It, mean? it means it is a doctrinal term within Christianity describing theological positions that focus on Jesus Christ. All right? <clears throat> Christocentric theology makes Christ the central theme of, all right, about which all other theological positions or doctrines are oriented. In other words, the message of the cross, right, revolves around Christ and his work on Calvary. Meaning, therefore, anything that comes out of that, all right, anything that comes out of that, uh, everything we got, all the benefits is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. In other words, the message of the cross is redemption. It is salvation. It is deliverance. It is healing. It is prosperity. It is all of that. But all of this is as a result of the cross. Are you listening now? All of it is as a result of the cross. Now, unfortunately, today, much of the church, we are no longer preaching uh, Christocentric uh, messages, but self-centric messages. All right? It's all about 
getting you to be a better person? Well, the only way you can be a better person if you it is if you know Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. All right. Now, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 14, please, says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, lift up your hands and say with me, I glory in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read that to you from the Good News Bible. The Good News Bible says, As for me, however, I will boast only about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, lift up your hands and say with me, As for me, I will boast only about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I boast? Why does Paul, or why did Paul boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because that's where his redemption came from. That's where his salvation came from. That's where his healing came from. That's where all his prosperity came from. That's all. That was the guarantee of his prayers being answered. Can you say amen? All right. So I boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now. Let's go to Colossians and chapter 2. Colossians and chapter 2. We are going to read verse 12. All right, we're going to read verse 12. Incidentally, the book of Philippians and uh, the book of Colossians are very Christocentric uh, um, books of the Bible, epistles, Pauline epistles. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him. Look at that now. Buried with him, risen with him. All right. <clears throat> Through the faith of the operation of God. Now notice something here. Buried with him, wherein you are also risen with him. Through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now, it's very important for you to, under, to underline that, the uncircumcision of the flesh, because the Jews put heavy emphasis on the circumcision of the flesh, and they put heavy emphasis on the Sabbath. All right, now, it's, look what it says here. And you being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened, has he, Jesus, quickened, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How many? All trespasses. Blotting out, everybody said blotting out, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. The note that you couldn't pay. All right. Jesus paid for it, nailed it to the cross. It is finished. Tetelestai. Praise God. He nailed it to the cross. Verse 5. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, Look at verse 16. Now look at verse 16. Because of what Jesus did. All right. Because of what Christ did at the cross. Verse 16 now. He says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day. All right. A holy day or the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Is that clear? Because of what Jesus did, because of the operation of the Father in Christ, let no man, let no man judge you, all right, in respect to meat, drink, all right, in respect of a holy day, the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow. Now, I need you to circle the word shadow, Circle the word shadow. The Sabbath, the meat, the drink, the holy days, the new moon, the feast of Israel. These were all shadows of things to come. So circle the word shadow and then to, uh, underline the words things to come. But the body is of Christ. Now by the word body, write the word substance. In fact, if you've got 
newer translation, it will use the word substance. It will use the word shadow and substance. So everybody say after me, shadow, substance. Say it again, please. Shadow, and then what? Substance. Okay, so he says, verse 16, let me read again, please. Verse 16, because of what Jesus has done at the cross, let no man, don't let anybody, not the SDA or anybody else, all right? <clears throat> let no man therefore judge you in meat, in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow, here's the word shadow, of things to come, but the substance, the body, is of Christ. So write this down, please. Say, shadow, substance. Okay? Verse 18, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a volunt uh, voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now, so circle the word shadow. Now, let's go to, I want you, what, you, what you need to write down in your notes is shadow in the Old Testament, substance in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, all right, and verse 11. The shadow is in the Old Testament. The substance, all right, is in the New Testament. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for ensembles. Now circle the word ensembles. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Look in your Bible. So 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. And then Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image. Not the very image. It, it was the photograph. It was the preview, not the person. For the law having a shadow of things to come. So we've seen the word shadow, shadow, shadow. All right, which in Greek, I want you to write this down, the word ensembles, all right, is the word tupos, T-U-P-O-S. T-U-P-O-S. Now, from the word tupos, you get the English word types, and you get what is known as the doctrine of typology. All right? Tupos, T-U-P-O-S, from which you derive the English word type, T-Y-P-I-E, from which you get the doctrine of typology. Now, what is tupos? What is this? In a doctrinal sense of a type, it is of a person or thing prefiguring a future, meaning the Messiah. All right? So let me say it again. In a doctrinal sense, a type was a person or a thing prefiguring or previewing the future uh, in Christ. Pre previewing the future in Christ. Okay, now, let's go back to verse uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 17. And I'm going to teach you that today as we, we talk about the cross of Christ. I want to read that to you from the, from the King James, the Amplified, and the NIV. All right? I want you to look in your Bible, please. If you got your Bible, look at verse 17. These things, in other words, the Sabbath, the new moon, the holy day, the holy day, and so forth and so on, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Okay. Let me read that to you from the Amplified. Such things are only a shadow of what is to come, and they have only symbolic value. But the substance, the reality of what was foreshadowed, belongs to Christ. The shadow, all right, <clears throat> is the Old Testament. Christ is the substance. Christ is the reality. Christ is the substance of the shadows which were, which were 
prefiguring or previewing the person of Christ. Are you listening now? The NIV says, these are the shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The shadow, these are the shadow of things that were to come. But Christ has come. So the substance has come. We do not need the shadows anymore. Now, let me read that. Let me read a, a commentary for you. The People's Bible Notes for Colossians chapter 2 and verse 17. It says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. The body or the substance which casts the shadow is Christ. Right? <clears throat> we are to pay no attention to the shadows. Did you hear that now? We are to pay no attention to the shadows. That's why we do not keep the Sabbath. That's why we do not keep the feast. Are you listening? All these were commemorating Christ. All right? We are to pay no attention to the shadows since Christ has come. All right? <clears throat> but we are to observe what we find in him and the gospel. Can you say amen? Thank you, Lord Jesus. So what I want you to do is to write this down. Okay? Shadows on one side, on your left-hand side, and then on your right-hand side, write substance. All right? Shadows on the left hand side and on the right hand side, substance. Okay? Underneath that, write the word <clears throat> uh, preview, preview underneath shadow on your left hand side, write the word preview or prefigure. And then on the right hand side, on the substance, write the word uh, person, person and reality. Person and reality. Then underneath shadow preview, write the word type. Write the word type. T-Y-P-E. Then on the right hand side, on the substance, on the person or reality, write the word antitype. Antitype. A-N-T-I-T-Y-P-E. All right. Antitype. So I hope you got this in your notes. All right, shadow, substance. Shadow in the Old Testament, substance in the New Testament. All right, <clears throat> preview, prefigure of the Old Testament, the person and the reality of Christ in the New Testament. The type in the Old Testament becomes the antitype in the New Testament. Okay? So I want you to write this down. The thing that does the prefiguring, the previewing, or the pointing is called a type. And what it points to in its fulfillment is called the antitype. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? Whatever was in the Old Testament as types and shadows, the fulfillment is called Antitype, A-N-T-I-T-Y-P-E. That is the theological, biblical definition of the word antitype, A-N-T-I-T-Y-P-E. That's the fulfillment thereof. Okay, so let me say it again. Let me emphasize this to you. The antitype fulfills the type. You get that? The antitype is what? The fulfillment of the type. Or, if you like, the antitype completes the reason that the type was given. Once the antitype showed up and fulfilled it, we no longer need the shadow. We no longer need the types. All right? They have become obsolete. They have become obsolete. Now, write this down. Again, you're going to school today, so praise God, you got to write down a number of things. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let me have a sip of a cup of tea, please. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, types, tupos, types were defined by three elements. Types, Tupos, 
were defined by three elements. Write this down. Number one, the type that was put forth. It could be a person. It could be a character. It could be a day. It could be an, a, a ritual. All right? So it was the, defined by number one, the type that was put forth. Number two, the second um, thing that defined types is the passage of time. The passage of time. <laughs> Sounds like uh, the vice president who kept giving us a word salad. The passage of time. The passage. <laughs> and everybody else was laughing at her. But here we're talking about the passage of time. And number three is the fulfillment of the time. The fulfillment of the time. So, write it down in your notes. Thank you, Jesus. Types were defined, or are defined, by three elements. Number one, the type that is put forth. It can be a person. For example, uh, <clears throat> Isaac is a type of Christ. Joseph is a type of Christ. Are you listening? The Sabbath was a type of the rest in Christ. Are you listening? All right. <clears throat> so the element, the types are defined by three elements. The type put forth, number one. Number two, the passage of time. And number three, the fulfillment of the type in the antitype in Christ. All right. Okay. I want you to write this down now in your notes. Once the type has been fulfilled by the antitype, the types, whether it was a person, uh, whether it was an institutional ritual, they are now obsolete. They are now obsolete. And I wish to God that many Christians will get this. This is why... The SD, SDA is completely irrelevant to us today, all right? It's because it has already been accomplished in Jesus. Are you listening? All right, now what does the SDA stand for? Seventh-day Adventist. Are you listening? And uh, and some of what people call the Hebraic movements that's trying to get you back to pray on the prayer shawl. If you have a prayer shawl, knock yourself out. But it is not... Uh, imperative for you to put that prayer shawl over your head to pray. Are you listening? Or oh, you do not need to be circumcised if you are not circumcised. Are you listening? You do not need to be keeping the feast or the Sabbath. Are you listening to me now? Can you say amen? All right, so the types can be ceremonies, can be an object, can be uh, a position. What, what do I mean by position? Priest? prophet, king, all right, the high priest, all these were types of Christ. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> or feast commemoration or even places. Okay, now, in the New Testament, I want you to write this down. In the New Testament, a type, all right, is fulfilled or you recognize the fulfillment of a type when you will see the words as, even as or just as or the word as, right? These terminology, whatever Bible that you're using, even as, just as or the word as lets you know that a type of, uh, of the Old Testament has been fulfilled in Christ, the antitype. Can you say amen? Praise God. Now, look at this now. John chapter 3 and verse 13. You will see the word as, or even as, just as, even uh, uh, what depends on what type of Bible you use. John chapter 3 verse 14. I always use the King James, okay? And as Moses, you see that now? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so... The Son of Man must be lifted up. So, and as, on the line in your Bible, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. For as Jonah 
was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, all right, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, let me explain this to you now. All the types of the Old Testament were pointing forward, pointing into the future to Jesus. Once Jesus came, fulfilled all of it, there's nothing pointing to the future. Are you listening? So now, what do we have in the New Testament? If they had rituals in the Old Testament pointing to Christ, pointing to the cross, what do we have in the New Testament? Well, we do have some rituals in the New Testament, but it has nothing to do with the Sabbath because all of these were pointing to the cross. Our ritual now look back to the cross. Are you listening to me, somebody? Can you say amen? So the three types of ritual for the church age, for the church age, which means the age in which you and I are living, are communion, water baptism, and anointing with oil. These are the three rituals that we have in the New Testament. And all of them is looking back to what Christ accomplished at the cross. Can you say amen? So I want you to understand this now. All the rituals, all the ceremonies, all the types of the Old Testament were pointing into the future to the cross of Christ. But what we have in the New Testament, the three rituals that we have, water baptism, uh, communion, and uh, the anointing of oil for healing is looking back to what Jesus has already done. I can't make it any more simple than that. All right? If you don't get this now, I, I mean, uh, God help you. God help you. This is why we do not need anybody who tells you that you got to keep the Sabbath. Don't know the cross. In fact, the Bible called these people enemies of the cross. And if we have time, we will deal with that today. Are you listening to me, somebody? All right. <clears throat> and you'll find that the enemies of the cross are within and without. The enemies of the cross are within the church and without the church. Are you listening to me, somebody? And a lot of the enemies of the cross are standing behind the pulpit. Are you listening? Trying to revert people back to the law. Are you listening? Can you say amen? So let me say it again. The three types of ritual for the church age, we know it's uh, communion, anointing with oil, water baptism, and it's looking back, looking back to what was accomplished in the cross. The communion, all right, we are what? Remembering the death. And, and, and you notice you will notice this. The key word attached to communion and all three is remember. Remember. <laughs> you remember because it's something that was done before. Can you say amen? <clears throat> <clears throat> and what is important for you to understand is that it is never the ritual which has the power, but what the ritual stands for. Amen. For what the ritual stands for. It always goes back to the cross of Christ. Can you say amen? Faith does not stand in the water, nor in the oil, nor in the communion elements, but what they stand for, the finished work of Christ on the cross that has brought deliverance. All right. That is as simple, as simple as it can get. All the Old Testament types and rituals were pointing toward the future. Once it has been fulfilled in the antitype, in the person of Jesus Christ, they are now obsolete. What we have today are three things that looks back to the cross, which are what? Communion, water baptism, and 
the uh, anointing with oil, with oil for healing. Did you notice again that, did you notice now that healing is, amen, part of our ritual in the church, anointing with oil? Can you say amen? That's why I said to you that the cross is our double cure. The cross is our double cure. It delivers us from sin and delivers us from sickness and disease. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, that's about as simple, as simple as I can put it. Okay? Now, let's go to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers in chapter 21. Thank you, Lord. Today, we are looking at the Numbers concept of the cross. The concept of the cross. <clears throat> Amen. Through the book of Numbers. Like I said, there's, there are too many to look at in the book of Leviticus. Okay, thank you, Lord Jesus. Book of Numbers. And the people spake against God, verse 5, and against Moses. Wherefore, have you brought us up out of Egypt to die? Wherefore, have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. Notice that, they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray unto the Lord that he taketh away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. Won't you notice that? Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone, how many? Everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. When he looketh, when he looketh. Here is the New Testament grace. Look and live. Now, whereas the law was trying to tell you, do and live, but you did and you died. Are you listening? All right. Now, whosoever will look upon it shall live. Anybody that is bitten when they look upon the, that serpent on the pole, they will live. Now, look at verse 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass. Brass is judgment. Remember, we talked to you about yesterday, the, gold, uh, the, the brazen altar, the altar of brass. Wood made out of shittim wood and overlaid with brass. Right? Jesus bore our judgment. And so Moses, verse 9, made a serpent of brass and put it upon the pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, how many men? Any man. When he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, you'll find this, you've just read this in the book of Numbers. This happened under Moses's Era. All right. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 3. Now, everybody knows about John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Everybody knows that. But do you understand that verse? 16 is preceded by verse 14 and 15. Let's read, let's read John 3, please. John 3, glory to God, hallelujah. Let's read verse 
14. And this is from the mouth of Jesus. <clears throat> this is from the mouth of Jesus himself. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so he's referring to Numbers 21. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Jesus said the type was in the Old Testament as Moses lifted up the brass serpent upon the pole. The end of type is here. So shall the Son of Man also be lifted up. Are you listening now? John chapter 12, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jesus. John chapter 12, glory to God forever. Verse 32. And I, aha, uh -huh, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, look at Genesis chapter 22 and verse 13. You can see the word lifted up, lifted up. All right, lifted up. Thank you, Jesus. In the Old Testament, Numbers 21, whoever lifted their eyes and, and wants to be bitten by that snake, by snake, by serpent, when they lifted up their eyes and look at that snake, Okay, that brass snake upon the pole, they lived. Now, look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 13. Genesis chapter 22, verse 13 says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Now, you remember that the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 that the gospel was preached to Abraham, or Abraham preached the gospel to us, that the just shall live by faith. What do we know as well? Moses also preached the gospel. Are you listening? Through the serpent on that pole. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have just read in Numbers 21 is a beautiful powerful illustration of the cross. All right? Rather than God taking away all the serpents, right? God provided a remedy. Are you listening? God provided a remedy in the form of a serpent. Now, what does that mean? When I used to read that years ago, it used to bother me. Why did he just put a lamb upon the pole? Why did he put a serpent upon the pole? Are you listening to me now, somebody? Can you say amen? Just as God did not take away the penalty of sin when Adam sinned, God provided a remedy in the Lord, in Christ Jesus, who died in our place as our substitute to pay for our sins on the cross. Now, like I said to you, it used to bother me. Why was it a serpent on the cross? Well, we know that a serpent is the reminder or the symbol or the emblem of the curse, right? It was through the serpent... <clears throat> that Adam and Eve were seduced. Are you listening? And brought under the curse. But on the cross, Jesus was made a curse. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. All right? By being made a curse for us, for it is written curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Are you listening? Now, <clears throat> can you say amen? On the cross, Jesus was made a curse for us. Now the word made, M-A-D-E, in the Greek text is this. He was legally constituted. Legally constituted. That's why I told you at the cross is the great exchange. He took our sin, our curse, to give us his righteousness. Can you say amen? Can you say thank you, Lord Jesus? Now, a brass serpent, brass in the Bible, 
is symbolic of judgment. Judgment. Are you listening to me, saints? So on the cross, he bore your judgment. He took your judgment. Can you say amen? The serpent speaks to us of the curse which sin brought. Jesus didn't sin. He never sinned. He was sinless. But he took your sin. He took your sin. He took my sin. He took the sin of the world. Are you listening to me now? Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And the pole speaks to us of the cross. On the cross, Jesus, amen, was made a curse. Galatians 3. He took our sins. Amen. He who knew no sin was made to be sin. So that we can be made or legally constituted the righteousness of God. Are you listening? Just like you were not born righteous. None of us were born righteous. We had to be made righteous to be legally constituted righteous. So the cross, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen is a legal transaction. Are you listening to me, somebody? The cross was what? A legal transaction. It was the place of transfer. It was the place where the note of sin was paid for. Can you shout amen? Can you say amen? Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. When he said, if I be lifted up, it means that uh, John 12, uh, in John 12, verse 32, 33, and if I be lifted up, from the earth I will draw all men unto me. This said he, signifying by uh, what death he should die. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? And Moses was told by God, if you put that serpent, that brass serpent, on a pole, glory to God, whoever looked at it will be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, Moses preached the gospel of grace. So let me say it to you this way. Noah preached the gospel of grace. Noah preached the gospel of the cross. Abraham preached the gospel of the cross. Moses preached the gospel of the cross. The whole thing is about the gospel of the cross, which is the gospel of grace. It's by grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone, on the merit of the scripture alone, to the glory of God alone, and by the blood alone. Can you say amen? Through the cross alone. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So don't you ever allow anybody to deceive you. Tells you you're going to do this, you're going to do that. No, 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 no. It's believe and receive. Look and live. Look. This is the New Testament. This is the gospel of grace. Look and live, believe and receive. That's the law of faith. That's the law of faith. Believe and receive, look and live. Look and live. Can you say amen? Now, let me close with this today. I've got a few minutes left. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Now watch this. Watch this. Philippians chapter 3. Paul is talking to the Philippian church. Incidentally, tonight, Pastor Kent will be talking about the book of Philippians. All right, this is part two of his book of Philippians. Praise God. But look what Paul said to the Philippian church. <clears throat> and if I heard correctly from, from uh, Pastor Kent, he said that Philippian has no Old Testament quotes. All right. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. I want you to pay attention to verse 1 to verse 3 to verse 4, and then we're going to look at verse 17 to verse 19. Now follow along. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So there's what? Safety in repetition. This is why we got to keep preaching the same thing over and over and over again. Let me let me say this to you. Uh, some of you who are preachers right now, you are always looking for a brand new sermon. You're always looking for something new, something exotic, something uh, something weird. No, preach the same thing. 
People don't get it because you preach it one time. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, if you don't keep preaching the same thing, how are people going to be established in the truth? The reason why we keep preaching grace, preaching faith, preaching the cross, preaching redemption is for the fact for people to be established. Because if you're not careful, you can be easily swayed and deceived and bewitched. That's what happened to the Galatian church. Now, he says, for me to write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. So write this down. There is safety in repetition. There is safety in repetition. Look at it, how you can say the same thing in different multiple ways. All right. To drive in the information in the lives of people. Look at verse 2. Beware of dogs. Now, do you realize what Paul just said now? He's writing to Gentiles who the Jews, whom the Jews used to call dogs. <laughs> do you even remember when Jesus said uh, to the Syrophoenician woman, it is not good to give the children's bread to dogs because Jews called Gentiles dogs. And a lot of it had to do with their diet, what they ate and didn't eat. He says, beware of dogs. But now Paul turns the table and calls. You know who, do you know who he was calling dogs? Judaizers. All right. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. And beware of concision. Ha! Circle the word concision in your Bible. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit. Praise the Lord. He said, we are the true circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. And we have no confidence in the flesh. Now he was calling Judaizers who were stressing circumcision, the observation, observing of the Sabbath and of circumcision as the two means that even though you were born again, you still had to do that. But Paul calls them dogs. Are you listening? And Paul refers to them. They will refer themselves as the circumcision. But Paul says, no, they're not the circumcision. We are the true circumcised one. They are the concision. In other words, Paul was saying, hey, your circumcision is nothing but mutilation. <laughs> uh, can you see how the Apostle Paul was... Uh, just like me, blunt, just like me. You think your circumcision is going to get you saved? You've done nothing but mutilate yourself. In fact, when you read the book of Galatians, Paul goes even further. He says, man, y'all trying to tell us about being uh, circumcised? Wish to God you castrate yourself. The apostle Paul was nothing like some of these puny preachers that we've got in the pulpit that don't say anything. This man was blunt. Praise God. Can you say, man, we make no apology for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? I'm going to tell you right now, there's only one way to God. There's only one way to God, to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. It is not through circumcision. It is not through the observing of the Sabbath days. It is not through the observing of the feast. Uh, uh, all, you, all these were pointers. All these were pointers. Are oh, you listening to me, somebody? Can you say amen? So Paul calls them dogs. He calls the Judaizers evil workers. Beware of the concision. Because the same thing happened to the Galatian church. Galatia these were goals who were Gentiles, got saved by grace, and then Judaizers got in there and was trying to tell them, you got to do this, you got to get circumcised now, you got to observe the Sabbath, and blah, 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 blah. Are you listening? And Paul was hard on them. In fact, Paul said to the Galatian church, you have been bewitched. You have been bewitched. All right, now come down to verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have walked, as you have, so as you have us for an example. 
for many, verse 18, walk, of whom I have told you often, and now I tell you even with weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are the what? The enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is their whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So I want you to write this down, please. The enemies of the cross are within and without. Okay? The enemies of the cross are within and without. The within were the Judaizers, those who were trying to revert people back into the law, into the observance of Sabbath, and so forth, and so on, and so forth, and so on. All right? Legalistic preachers. Legalism in the church. Are you listening to me, somebody? Then, the enemies of the cross from outside are the false religion. All right? The secular world system. Are you listening to me, somebody? Can you say amen? Now, look at how, look at how they are defined. All right? So, write this down, please. The enemies of the cross, those who are within, all right? They are called as dogs, evil workers, concision. Those who are on the outside, ladies and gentlemen, Paul says their God is their belly. Now, belly refers to uh, out of your belly, right? Out of your system, your own self, all right? Your own self, whose God is their belly, their flesh, their, 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 their nature, their carnal nature is their belly. And you see that in the world system today, all right? You just... Watch what's going on right now with Disney. These are people whose God is their own belly. Fallen, uh, iniquitous nature. Are you listening? Whose glory is in their shame. Their glory in their shame. My, my, my. What used to be called shame years ago, today people glory about it. People make it, this is the lifestyle. All right, there was a time in America, there was a time in England where shacking together was shameful. Now, people boast about it. Their glory is their shame. And who mind earthly things. Who mind earthly things. Uh, one of these days, I will just do a series on the enemies of the cross. Do not be an enemy of the cross. Let me tell you this. If you go back into observing days, holidays, um, feast, um, and putting people under all kind of bondage, that if you don't put the prayer shawl, that you can't, your prayer will not be answered, and that you must observe the Sabbath, and so forth and so on, you are an enemy of the cross. You are an enemy of the cross. The cross has nullified all of this, because the antitype has been here, Amen. The, uh, the antitype is here. He fulfilled all the types. Can you say amen? That's enough for today. Praise God. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Faith Lift Radio podcast. For more information about Dr. Glenn and how to offer your financial support, log on to glenarecchion.org.